So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome you here to the Open Gov Hub. Uh, my name is Neda Dufi, and I'm the director here at the Open Gov Hub. Um, and again, I'm really delighted to welcome you um, for a special event that we're having with several distinguished guests. Um, so here at the Open Gov Hub, our mission is really to support the implementation of open government reforms all around the world. Um, so that includes efforts to improve government transparency, accountability, and citizen participation. And we do all of this by really helping organizations share resources and work together to have greater collective impact. Um, and by hosting thought-provoking discussions like the one we'll have today, um, this is a key way that we really try to activate an environment which is conducive for collaboration um, with our wide network of partners and members. Um, and currently that member network includes uh, over 40 international NGOs, uh, organizations, and over 200 people who are members of the community. Um, and so before I introduce our program for today and our speakers, um, I'm especially delighted to introduce a distinguished guest, which we have. Um, so we're really honored to have Albania's ambassador to the United States with us, um, Her Excellency Floretta Faber, um, who's here with us and um, has kindly taken time out of her busy schedule um, to just give us a brief uh, word of welcome. So ambassador, please, thank you. Thank you. It's such a great Pleasure, Nadia. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today and for you organizing and putting together uh, such great events. Um, and I'm so happy that I'm here because Albania is used uh, as one of the best practices and uh, um, one of the, uh, of the examples of how much we are doing to fight corruption in our country. Um, there is a move in many countries in the world in fighting corruption, as we have seen today the increase of the phenomenon around the globe. Corruption is a challenge of the open societies. It's not a trend only for new democracies, neither a phenomenon of the poor countries. One danger with the corruption is that the reality sometimes is not the same as the level of the corruption in the country. There are cases when perception ruins the positive steps taken, and there are times when corruption is covered under good laws and very developed societies, but the profits are to the level that people still take the risk and the chance, or will they be called for now? The duty of the government and the society is to look ahead, imply best practices, embrace the best laws and ethical behavior, and set up systems that keep the malpractice and corruptive approaches distant from them. I personally have been part of the international visitor programs of the US government in 2010. The program on accountability of governance covered the entire spectrum of US government and for three weeks we visited and talked with all levels starting from the federal to the state to small towns where the mayor was part-time working as a mayor. That program was an excellent showcase and lessons to learn from how the checks and balances work and how everyone plays a great role in fighting the corrupting scheme. The politics, the judicial system, and the media are the three pillars. In Albania, we have added one more. We have involved the citizens. Albania is still a long way to go in fighting corruption. The numbers are not as satisfactory as we wish to be. Important is that all players are alert that fighting corruption should be in the main focus. This is why Albania is focused today in creating a number of mechanisms in order to ban and eliminate the factors which give ground to corrupting practices, in addition to establishing robust instruments to penalize the subjects caught and proven uh, involved in corruptive schemes. Albania's Supreme Audit Institution is one of the bodies who is here with us today, which gives a strong impact to promote accountability and transparent in fight against corruption in all levels of uh, public governance. But today Albania has taken very positive steps 
in fighting corruption. We have a strategy on fighting corruption. We have today a national coordinator. We have a new portal dedicated to corrupted cases where individuals can directly inform incidents and there is a commission in, other, in the other side that process and address all the requests. We have set up for the first time the system of town hall meetings. Every weekend we have prime ministers and member of government going around the country and talking directly to citizens and getting, taking comments from them. Albania has undertaken a big ref reform in implying the needs of businesses, entities, individuals for licensing, document, business registration, public tenders, consular service, an increased number of documents and certificates. All of them today are taken online with extreme reduced time in filling out and delivering the request, taking the response, and a good number of forms are generated online so you can have direct access to the information that you need. Albania has today over a hundred, uh, several hundred applications which are done online through the system of eAlbania. But the last but not the least, the biggest reform that the country took in the last year is the judicial reform. And the main uh, focus on the, the, the essential of doing this reform in the progress in the process of progressing democracy, developing the economy, and increasing the stability. It's, it's also a request of EU for Albania to open the negotiations and become members of the European Union. But it's positive that the Albanian government strongly believe this is a step to take forward because it's a need for the Albanian people. We have undergone deep improvements to the judicial system, performed a serious reform which has vetting for the first time in the basis of the change, a number of changes in the constitution, laws, regulations, building the new institutions was not easy. Many sides were opposing and making resistance to the change. Trust me, it was very tough. But now we are at the phase where we face reality. In 2018, the system has started running. Judges, prosecutors, in the future police will be under a complete vetting process. The new institutions are strongly believed to serve the stability, the security, economic development, the citizens of Albania, and a new perspective for young people so they can look Albania as a place that they will uh, build up in the future. We also hope to have a good example in the region. Some countries have already started asking the Albanian model of the changes of the judicial system. And we have told them, you need a good system in place, you need well-informed and educated people, a demanding society, sincerely concerned politicians in order to reach results. Government of Albania is really confident that this is the path forward. I also like to say that we could not do it alone. We had a strong support from the United States government, from the European Union, who helped us with strong goodwill, political support, financial means, expert exchange of best practices, and a dedicated work of people in the ground. We need international institutions like open government partnership. Working with this institution gave Albania the chance to be one of the best success stories in e-governance. We need organizations like Open Gov Hub to continue to keep people informed, trained, and put together events like this today. Keep working and we will be always ready to take the good steps together. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak today. Thank you again, Ambassador Faber, and um, we understand uh, with your schedule, you may not uh, be able to stay much with us, but really appreciate how your remarks have helped set the context for our discussion today. Um, and really, uh, it's in that spirit of learning from different countries' experiences on the different tools and practices of combating corruption that we're hosting this conversation today. Um, so um, with that, I just want to um, give a little bit more context briefly, um, because I realize some people in this room you know, may have lots of experience working with Supreme Audit Institutions, 
while others may be relatively new to the topic. Um, so um, the purpose really of our program today is to learn from different countries' experiences about how these highest oversight bodies, which exist at the Supreme Audit Institutions, um, along with other independent oversight bodies, can really play a key role in combating a huge variety of uh, manifestations of corruption. Um, and so we'll have each of our um, special guests here with us and speakers uh, give remarks for about 10 to 15 minutes um, and then have a facilitated conversation before we open up the floor for a, a broader discussion. Um, so the first speaker that I'm really pleased to introduce um, is part of a visiting delegation from Albania's Supreme Audit Institution. Um, so they've come a long way to be with us um, here in DC for the next few days. Um, and this is Mr. Ermal uh, Yazirij. I probably didn't say the last name right, but I'll keep working on it. Um, so he is the director of the legal department um, for control of standards implementation and ethics at the Albanian Supreme Audit Institution. Um, he started working for the Albanian SAI in 2012 and previously was a lecturer in the Faculty of Law at Tira uh, University of Tirana, teaching criminal law and cyber crime law. Um, he was also, this past year, a fellow actually hosted at the Government Accountability Office um, the Supreme Audit Institution here in the United States. Um, and from 2012 until now, um, he has uh, sent to the National Prosecution Authorities 266 different criminal cases as a result of their work. Um, so he'll be speaking more to that experience uh, soon. Um, so the next speaker after um, Irmal, we'll have Tony Gillich, um, who is here with us from the Government Accountability Office. Um, she is Assistant Director there and a Financial Crime Compliance Specialist. Uh, where she leads work involving forensic units, investigations, and performance audits that cover a range of issues from fraud schemes to money laundering. She also has 15 years experience in auditing banking, securities, and various payment system issues. And uh, in focusing on financial crimes, Tony has led audits on the oversight of suspicious activities reporting and banking and security regulators, anti-money laundering examinations, among other activities. Um, she's also provided technical assistance to numerous audits involving other financial crimes, including violations of financial sanctions programs, beneficial ownership, mortgage foreclosure rescue scams, international remittances and money laundering, kidnap and ransom insurance, de-risking, and cyber threats to banks. So clearly a very wide range of, of experiences that we look forward to hearing um, more about. Um, and after Tony, um, our last speaker, who will also then uh, serve as a moderator for the conversation, is Matthew Murray. Um, currently, Matthew Murray is serving as an international member of the Independent Joint Anti-Corruption Monitoring and Evaluation Committee of Afghanistan, uh, which is an agency that was created to monitor and evaluate anti-corruption efforts in the Afghan government. Um, and to report regularly to the president and parliament, um, as well as to the international community. In January 2017, um, he completed his second assignment with the Obama administration as senior advisor on governance and rule of law at the Center on Excellence for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance at USAID. From 2012 to 2015, Mr. Murray served with the Obama administration as deputy assistant secretary for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa at the Commerce Department. And from 2000 to 2012, Mr. Murray managed the Center for Business Ethics and Corporate Governance, which is an NGO he co-founded dedicating to building rule-based markets in Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Um, so I think without any further ado, I'm really delighted to hand over to our speakers who are each going to um, give a brief presentation and we'll have a conversation and then uh, ample time for some discussion with the audience uh, later on. So thank you. Um, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here, Paul. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I was a little bit uh, surprised when I saw Open Up. And something that surprised me was the fact that uh, you said uh, all the same with everyone else. And uh, it was difficult to. to Find is the, the, the <laughs> but, uh, 
think you also share possibility in the future together. <laughs> Regarding the topic, the fight against corruption, uh, typically uh, the fight against corruption is not the duty of SAI, the people. The fight against corruption is the duty only of the prosecuting authorities and the courts, criminal courts. But the um, SAIs all over the world uh, have decided to be engaged fully in the fight against corruption. And our SAI started to be very active from 2012. And from 2012 until now, we have sent to the persecution authorities 266 criminal cases for about 847. The officials or ex officials. And um, unfortunately, um, most of these cases are closed by prosecution authorities. And uh, the corruption has switched from the administration to the uh, prosecution, prosecutors and to the courts. Another level of corruption. I'm glad that the ambassador can be at the room, that you hear me saying bad things about the government. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it, you can see the government uh, participating uh, and contributing even to creating corruption and even to fighting corruption at the same time. They invent strategies. They, they do they do working plans, they create new goals, but still they manage to, to, to do corruption in the, the same time. Um, we kind of uh, have done an experiment in our country. That's why uh, the Albanian SAI case is very specific. To do 256 criminal cases for five years by doing criminal, uh, sending a criminal case every week to the prosecuting authorities. And it has been very difficult, still it's very difficult. We have a lot of pressure from politics, from business, businesses, from media also. Um, we don't have too much support. The public is our support. Um, we we have problems of uh, interpreting our work. Usually, where uh, we are interpreted as political institution, we try to find a balance between different political situations that the country uh, is going for the moment, and um, we have problems with our staff also. We are a very small uh, number, we have a very small number of staff, nearly 180. Uh, not everyone wants to be engaged in fighting corruption, it's difficult for them. Uh, also, we, we, we don't have too much uh, capacity to deal with all this <coughs> corruption. So we have the will, we have the strength, but we don't have too much time. Um, now, for the moment, Albania is trying to summon a justice reform, deep justice reform. Albania has suffered from the corruption in the justice system, in every cell of the justice. So, this reform is very deep. Uh, Tends to, to remove from office every prosecutor, every judge. But it's still under implementation. We are waiting for the new institution to be created. We want to collaborate with them. We want to share our experience. We want to reopen the closed cases that the prosecutors have already done. And Today, I choose three specific cases just to give you an idea of what we have done and what we are dealing with. Like, okay. um, this 
which is the last one. Here is case number one. We received the whistleblower letter and we did a special OE. Uh, the audit was done through a state owned company uh, that uh, deals, with, uh, it's a, it deals with the water distribution in the local system. And we found that, that the director of that company has sold his car to a branch for nearly. Uh, for the fourteen thousand dollars, and then bought it back by procurement for eighty thousand dollars. And the car was Range Rover Sport, two thousand seven, flavor six, fully optional, and <laughs> it was it was intended to transport pumps, water pump, and uh, water pipe to to the village. I don't know how you can transport. It. Very luxury, <laughs> and um, yes, we sent the case to the prosecutor authority, and we found out again by the whistleblower that the prosecution authority sent to the court the people that did the procurement, but not the owner of the car who sold and bought that own car, and we wanted to be part of the. In no um, case, we went to the court and asked the judge that it's our right to be part because we are the ones that uh, did the criminal charges. And we also requested the prosecutor to give us information on the case, how he concluded that uh, the director wasn't responsible. And uh, the prosecutor still hasn't responded to our. our uh, Request and the judge uh, didn't accept our request to be part of. The second case is um, kind of funny. We received uh, some criminal charges on the choice of the oil owned company, state owned company. And there were three directors there, but we forgot to put the name. Of one of the directors at the front page of the of the criminal charge, and we said, okay, no problem, because uh, his name was mentioned several times on the other page of the criminal And uh, the case was closed, and uh, we requested a copy of the criminal files, investigation files, and we found out that. The prosecutor has not uh, contacted the sixth person mentioned in the criminal charges, they have not interrogated him. Okay, we we'll leave the, the still did not uh, say anything, but we requested to the court that all the uh, persons in the criminal charges document be, be present at the, at the court session. It's a requirement from criminal procedure code. And uh, still we lost the case on the first thing, and then we went to the appeal court, to the appeal uh, court, and then we presented this fact that, wait a minute, there are six guys who applied, and the sixth guy, guy was never interrogated. And at that moment, the prosecutor learned that there was a sixth guy, and the uh, court for the first instance learned that it was a right? So somebody reads our criminal charges. If they if they had read our criminal charges, they no problem would have interrogated even the sixth guy and still close the case. The third case is um, one of the most important ones. There were 14 people to spy RSAI. Of them, the minister, current ones, big scandal. Yeah. Before we send the files to the first authorities, the uh, debate started with the parliament. We cannot be, we couldn't be very active at that moment because we would be interpreted 
it as political institution. So we waited a little bit, but still we sent the case to the prosecution authorities. And this case was uh, investigated by the general prosecutor, the highest level of the authority, and they closed the case. We requested the, the files, and the Supreme Court said that they didn't have paper, they didn't have stuff, and they didn't have uh, ink for the copy. So we provided everything for ourselves, and we went to photocopy everything. And while we were reading the the interrogation, yeah, we found similarities in paragraphs. They looked the same, even uh, errors were the same. And we attached them with uh, tape, and we make these long lines. It's our whole testimony. And from the right one, you can see two ministers, then secretary general, and then another secretary. And the longest one is the main minister who did the corruption. And the last one is the general secretary of the council of ministers. And we colored all the paragraphs that were the same. And it looks like the, the longest line, which is the main minister that did the corruption, had only two paragraphs that were unique for him. It was the name of his parents, his birthday, and at the end there was a paragraph that stated that the state profited from this action and it was a corruption. And everything was copied from others. So we presented this to the High Court, and the High Court shouted at us, we closed this spreadsheet, they did not accept it. We still leave that to, to the High Court, and uh, our, our complaint was 51 pages, and the court decision was signed, and it took the court every six months to produce it. And um, we don't know where to complain about it because it was the highest court. And uh, these are typical examples of what we deal with. And uh, now we find corruption in the justice system, which is the worst scenario. Uh, until now, we, we, we have uh, had problems on taking corruption and sending it to the prosecution authorities. But right now we have problems that uh, the justice is not closing our cases. And uh, we are waiting for the justice response. And we hope this case is again. Um, regarding our, our work, we don't see the fight against corruption. We don't see it um, only in detecting and corruption and sending it to the prosecution. So prevention is a, is a very important role. Uh, we want to, to, to start being engaged in the, in the promoting uh, legal change. So legal corruption is another form, a sense form of corruption. Uh, sometimes they use the government and the parliament to make legal what's legal for the moment. After that, you can do anything, but it becomes legal. They can continue to do that uh, freely. And we have found during our audits a lot of loopholes, loopholes in the legislation that promote corruption. And we, we think that by being very active in, in, in drafting new laws and presenting them to the parliament, to the media, to the society, <coughs> very helpful and not waiting for the government to do it or not waiting for the parliament to do it. Um, we also have increased our training on fighting against corruption. We we have a small budget but still we 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 invest in training our staff. We we have started relations uh, with the GAO in the third year, we sent uh, students to jail. So we, we sent students to die of Poland, to Hungary, to Netherlands, and um, we 
want to gain as much experience as possible. And uh, we think that uh, the, the experience that uh, every other SAI has um, would help us a lot in, in, in dealing with problems that we, we are facing for the first time. Um, we don't have any other allies besides those that are external. We see every other institution or or entity as as opposition. It's very difficult to do it in a situation like this where we cannot trust the integrity of the institutions that you're supposed to work with. Uh, Transference International did an uh, assessment on the integrity of uh, 15 Albanian institutions, and it showed up that uh, we had the uh, uh, biggest point, uh, and the uh, justice uh, institution had the lowest one. Even the civil society had the lowest one. So, just by comparing the, the integrity, of our institution with that of the justice system, it's very difficult to collaborate with them and to, to, to deal with them. So basically this were, were this was what I, I plan to, to, to talk to you today. I'm open to any questions. Just don't ask me the name so <laughs> the first <laughs> Well, I started off by saying um, the comments that I share today with you are from my own, uh, uh, those of my employer. I'll uh, share my observations. For the official word on what GAO has to say on anything, I commend you to our reports and our testimonies, which GAO. She's bringing up that rapid. Um, recent corruption scandals in both public and private sectors, I think it's all clear, and I've heard some examples here, have contributed significantly to the erosion of public trust in institutions and businesses alike. We have seen it so many times in so many ways, from petty corruption to grand corruption, and that is, wide, long path of destruction associated with it, involving the diversion of public and private funds, the distortion of markets, financing of war and terrorism, trafficking and smuggling of people, guns, drugs, and growth and inequality. Never a lone actor, corruption is often intertwined with its other horrible cousins, including fraud, bribery, money laundering, tax evasion, I can go on and on. Fraud involves obtaining something of value through misrepresentation, and fraud schemes are often facilitated by corruption. GAO has indirectly examined corruption in evaluating programs aimed at combating these bills. In numerous reports and testimonies before Congress, making, re making recommendations to the affected agencies. As institutions created to provide independent oversight and accountability of the spending and activities of national governments, one of the most important roles of size in combating corruption involves their efforts to improve methods and tools for identifying program vulnerabilities that facilitate fraud and corruption. And so one such tool is GAO's, a framework for managing fraud risk in federal programs, which we issued in 2015, to help managers combat fraud and preserve integrity in government agencies. The fraud risk framework acknowledges that the agency may have concurrent initiatives to manage risk, such as enterprise risk management efforts. Fraud risk management activities may be incorporated into or aligned with such internal activities and strategic objectives, including anti-corruption efforts. In fact, there are a number of synergies that can be leveraged. So in addition to being a resource for program managers, GAO has also used the fraud risk framework in whole or in part as criteria in its work evaluating the effectiveness of the programs. The framework itself encompasses the structures and environmental factors that influence or help managers achieve their objectives 
to mitigate fraud risks, as well as control activities to prevent, detect, and respond to fraud, with an emphasis, obviously, on prevention. In addition, it highlights the importance of monitoring and incorporating feedback, which are ongoing practices. You will find that the four components for effectively managing fraud risks complement other frameworks used in anti-corruption efforts. For example, the overarching components of the fraud risk framework generally track with the United Nations Global Compact uh, Management Model Framework for Implementation. The compact, as many of you may know, is referenced in UN guidance to private sector companies on conducting anti-corruption risk assessments. Within the framework, the first overarching concept involves a demonstration of the commitment to combating fraud by creating an organizational culture. We found in our work using the fraud risk framework as criteria that having that tone at the top about the importance of fraud risk management supports the progress in all other areas of fraud risk management. Effective risk managers also involve all levels of the agency, such as mid-level managers and entry-level employees, in setting an anti-fraud tone that permeates the organizational structure. In our review of fraud risk management at the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, we found that CMS has shown a commitment to combating fraud, in part by establishing a dedicated entity to lead anti-fraud efforts. Sound familiar? That's a, a theme you'll find in, in anti-corruption um, programs as well. And that CMS was offering requiring anti-fraud training for stakeholder groups such as providers and beneficiaries and health insurance plans. However, it was not requiring fraud awareness training on a regular basis for its own employees, a practice that the fraud risk framework identified as a way agencies can help create a culture of integrity and compliance. Among other things, GAO recommended that CMS provide and require fraud awareness training to its employees. Second, program managers must plan uh, regular fraud risk assessments and determine a fraud risk profile. This, among other things, involves identifying all relevant fraud risks and existing controls, and then developing a risk profile that articulates areas where additional controls are needed and the risk tolerance for all areas. Third, the program managers are to design and implement a strategy with specific control activities to mitigate the assessed fraud risk and then collaborate to help ensure effective implementation. <coughs> Lastly, as those ongoing efforts I mentioned, program managers are to evaluate outcomes using a risk-based approach and adapt activities to improve fraud risk management over time. So let me give you an example. In our recent work evaluating the effectiveness of fraud risk management at the U.S. Social Security Administration's Disability Insurance Program, we reported that SSA identified in 2011 a vulnerability within its case management system used by administrative law judges that could potentially allow judges to improper, improperly reassign cases. And it was this very vulnerability that allowed a corrupt SSA administrative law judge over a seven year period to assign more than 3,000 disability benefits cases to his doctor in exchange for more than $600,000 in cash payments from a disability lawyer. The judge would contact the attorney and tell him exactly what type of medical evidence was needed to su um, support uh, a disability finding, and then award the benefits to claimants um, that the lawyer represented without actually holding any hearing. As a result, the attorney ultimately received at least $7.1 million in representative fees from SSA, and the judge further obligated SSA to pay more than $550 million in lifetime benefits. That's a grand scale. Here, a fraud risk assessment could have assisted SSA in identifying the corruption-related vulnerability, the need for controls to address fraud risk, and the magnitude of potential harm, and links to related risks such as inside of rent. As part of our examination of SSA, we recommended, among other things, that SSA conduct a risk assessment for the program and develop a risk-based strategy to manage its fraud risk. I do have some other observations to share, not just about GAO, but how GAO interacts with its counterparts, other sides within INTOSAI, which is the international organization of Supreme <coughs> Audit Institutions. In particular, I've helped GAO uh, in its work supporting the Working Group on the Fight Against Corruption and Money Laundering, 
which recently developed guidance to assist, assist site auditors in preparing and conducting the audit of anti-corruption policies and procedures in government organizations. Issued in 2016, ESI 5700, entitled Guideline for the Audit of Corruption Prevention, highlights anti-corruption policies, structures, and processes in these organizations, and can be used as an audit tool by the auditors. It may also be used by the auditees as guidance for implementing and carrying out their own anti-corruption activities. The guideline describes um, setting up anti-corruption structures, approaches for risk assessment, and risk analysis, and monitoring practices. Again, sound familiar? The main emphasis is placed on the modules of an effective anti-corruption organization, organization, such as the delimitation of duties, job rotation, role of internal review, and human capital, including raising awareness and training of employees. Effective tools are also needed in the long and arduous process of identifying and returning uh, assets to victim countries <coughs> plundered by their collective credit leaders. The development of guidance on auditing issues related to asset recovery is also under consideration by a subgroup of the working group on the fight against uh, corruption and money laundering. Additionally, the working group on the audit of extractive industries held its steering committee meeting at GAO in September of 2017. External speakers from civil society provided presentations on resources available to SAI examining these areas, which are notoriously vulnerable to corruption. For example, a representative from the NGO of the National Resource Governance Institute presented information on how SAIs could use their Natural Resource Governance Index, which seeks to measure the quality of resource governance in 81 countries that together produce 82% of the world's oil. Is the product of 89 country assessments compiled by over 100 researchers using almost 10,000 supporting documents to answer 149 questions. SIDE could use the resource governance index, country profiles, and downloadable data explorer to inform their work. The country profiles provide a general sense of how well a country's governance systems match up against other <coughs> countries and against global standards. This snapshot could help SIDE identify major risk areas, including those related to corruption, and fraud, inform the objectives and scope of audits, and put evidence in context and outline alternative approaches from other countries to include uh, in audit recommendations. Lastly, there are sites that have worked collabor collaboratively on audits related to, uh, or at least indirectly, anti-corruption issues. In 2015, a group of sites from English-speaking Africa conducted parallel audits on the government's implementation of national content policies in the oil and gas sector in their respective countries. Guys can also examine in international overlap or unclear lines of responsibilities in the legal framework, which can create the environment conducive to fraud and corruption, as Sai Uganda did in its environment audit report on regulation and monitoring of drilling waste in the Alberton region in 2014. Sai's could also, I think, very importantly, audit tra the transparency of handing out contracts and licenses in the extractives industry, as Norway did in its 2010 report on the awarding production licenses in the petroleum sector. So I hope that gives you a snapshot into the ways in which size can develop tools to assist in anti-corruption efforts, how size can work together, um, <coughs> how size can examine those areas um, of uh, indirect connection to Thank you. So good morning, everybody, and uh, I'm going to do this without the benefit of, of slides this morning, uh, and I'm going to, uh, as, as uh, Nita indicated, I'm going to be giving you a presentation on um, an organization that I'm privileged to work for in Afghanistan, and then I'm going to be facilitating a wider discussion. As I was thinking a bit about what ties this all together, um, I came up with two possibilities, Nathan. You're going to have to corroborate this because you're the, you're the author here. The first one is that what do we have in common here? Afghanistan, Albania, America. I realize you might just be starting at the beginning of the other. <laughs> and the, the next session, I mean, there's, there's plenty of work to be done. So working through the alphabet, uh, country group by country group is, is as good as any approach. 
Uh, but the other possibility is that thematically what ties this together, and this will help me lead into explaining what where, where, um, where I'm making this contribution at this stage, is that we are, is there something wrong here? Um, our common goal, whether we're audit institutions or other types of anti-corruption activists, is to, uh, anti-corruption is always a means towards an end, and the end is the honest delivery of, of public services. Whether those public services are in the area of education, health, safety, security, access to justice, access to economic opportunity, human rights, and that is that is what these audit institutions, wherever they may be configured in their respective government architecture, are intended to do. We are we should be in the business of providing the information that is required for citizens to demand honest public services and to get honest public services on a responsive way. And so with that common theme in mind, let me give you some background on this, what is a unique kind of hybrid institution that has taken shape in the soil of Afghanistan, organically grown out of uh, many well-intentioned anti-corruption efforts in, in the country. And um, it, it, the, the name of the organization is it's called the Joint Independent Monitoring and Evaluation Committee. It was founded in the year 2010 at a donors conference in London in 2000 in, in London. And by donors conference, I mean there are multiple uh, contributors and funders of various efforts to um, work in Afghanistan, which is, after all, a country that's in the middle of a war, and um, uh, various. Uh, bilateral government agencies, multilateral government agencies, World Bank, IMF, and others have different um, streams of activity that they fund in the country to help the government with this goal of delivering on its public services. And at one point, it was deemed that the, the risk of corruption was so high, whether it was the exist the extant corruption risk within the environment or the risk that grows out of putting a lot of money, a lot of cash in a conflict zone, or whether it was some combination of that, there needed to be a specialized agency that was working um, not on the punishment side, but on the prevention side. So this Joint Independent Monitoring and Evaluation Committee, here and after referred to as the MET, uh, was created as a piece of uh, a fundamental foundation point for doing better prevention work in Afghanistan. And so starting in 2010, um, it was funded by three or four donors led by DFID and the, the United Kingdom, but also very much supported by USAID and other European donors, including the, the, the Danes and the Germans, um, has grown to a very mature point in 2018. So much so that uh, we are now um, a feature of we are now a feature of uh, sort of the legislative um, structure of the country. Uh, the MEC has been um, now officially authorized to do its activities through an executive decree of the president of Afghanistan. And uh, so, in addition to being supported by donors, we have a we have a legal foundation, and uh, we are now written into what is the new national anti-corruption strategy of Afghanistan, which was issued in December of 2017. And that strategy places us in a very interesting uh, position, which is to say, we are the agents of civil society. We are the ones who are uh, there to help civil society become better informed so that they can demand these honest public services. In a minute, I'll tell you what we actually do every day, but let me start with our theory of change, because that's what um, will help us do some comparison here. Our theory of change is that uh, you can't fight corruption anywhere in the world unless you have an informed, uh, and, and informed public that puts pressure on the government. That has to be sort of step one. 
And so um, our, our mission is to inform the Afghan public at every level in every part of the country um, about uh, whether they are getting the services that they are, are supposed to get or whether as a result of corruption they are not getting the services. Uh, the second component of our theory of change is that in order to make sure those services are delivered, we need to modernize government processes. And we need in particular to reduce the discretion that inevitably occurs, the high levels of discretion that occur, can occur in government processes anywhere in the world because of legislation, bad legislation, bad regulations, bad rules, or because of bad practices that results in there being a lot of room to either demand or supply a bribe within that government. So our, our second component of our theory of change is to make sure that we uh, can modernize government, government processes within Afghanistan. And then finally, this all is going to help us fight and, and reduce and hopefully eliminate corruption because of human agency, because we are going to be equipping both citizens and government officials like uh, these, these um, schemed individuals with the tools that they need and that at the end it's better information and better process augmented by human agency that will lead to a reduction. So within that theory of change and within um, the national anti-corruption strategy of Afghanistan. This is the MEC is an agent of change. And what do we do every day? Well, what we do every day, and this is the interesting part, I think, uh, from the point of view of my colleagues in this audience, um, what we do every day is very similar to what an audit institution does. And that, insofar as the main tool that we use, it's called a vulnerability to corruption assessment. And it would sound very much like the framework you just described it sound very much like the reports that, that were produced on the campaign. And a vulnerability to corruption assessment essentially will look at any ministry, education, health, interior, uh, our most recent uh, assessments. And we will identify first the key processes that are uh, part of the design of that ministry. What is it supposed to do? How is it supposed to get the, uh, the, the, you know, the pharmaceutical goods deployed at the right price throughout the country? How is it supposed to make sure that well-trained uh, teachers are teaching in the regions of Afghanistan? Um, and in the case of the Ministry of Interior, how is it uh, supposed to protect the citizen? And what we'll do is we'll go through um, in, uh, an assessment. First, what are those processes from beginning to end of, what, of how the processes are meant to work under the legislative framework, under the regulatory framework, under the rules. And then we'll do an assessment based on interviews, based on focus groups, based on uh, our discussions with experts who use these processes. And we'll make an assessment as to which points, which touch points within that process are vulnerable to corruption. And why are they vulnerable? Is it because the way the law is written? Is it because the actual interaction between government and citizen takes place in an opaque space? Uh, is it because of certain practices that have been traditionally tolerated? So we, we come up with a kind of assessment of that. And then we make recommendations as to how to fix that process, reduce that vulnerability. We do we use something called smart testing, just to say our recommendations need, need to be specific, they need to be measurable, they need to be actionable, uh, they need to be reasonable, and they need to be time bound. So that we're making recommendations that a champion within government, if they wanted to, could use to reform the government process, make sure the, the service is delivered in an honest, efficient, responsive. And so that's that's what the MEC has been set up to do. And for those, there's many, there are a couple experts in here who, who know the Afghanistan environment very, very well. Um, and who, um, who I'm sure, um, uh, sort of 
seen some of the worst and, and best of what Afghanistan is capable of. Um, what, what I would encourage you to do is think of this, this, this mechanism, the MEC, which is, by the way, not without its problems and its limitations, not without its capacity issue, um, is, a, is very much a, a work in progress. Um, but to think of it as eventually organically growing into the GAO for the Supreme Order. Why? Because what we do every day is, is, uh, is very similar. And maybe in Afghanistan in particular, this becomes sustainable because it involves something that's funded by the parliament, therefore it's independent, there are always, um, uh, and sort of maintain itself as an independent agent. Uh, so with, with those sort of thoughts in mind, um, I, I brought along, even though I don't have a PowerPoint, I do have some examples of the reports that we produce that you are welcome to, um, to, to take. Uh, this one is of the electricity sector. This one is a, a vulnerability assessment of the Attorney General's office where we've encountered uh, problems with you know, prosecuting corruption. And then there's another one there that's focused on the health sector. So you're welcome to take those if you're interested. And I think perhaps at this time we can turn it into a wider discussion. Um, so I'm going I'm to change the way I'm sitting. <laughs> um, so first of all, I found uh, both your uh, presentations very interesting. Congratulations. This is hard work, no matter where you do it. I will, however, say that uh, I think one of our goals today is that Anita seems a little bit happy for me, old um, And that may be because she works at a government agency, which is the second best place to work in the rest of the So, for those of you who are thinking about careers, uh, honestly, honestly, I think the GAO is probably a very good place to work because think of what you do every day, the skills you learn. You are an honest broker of our government. So that, that has to have a big satisfaction. You, on the other hand, have a, we're going to have to try to get you to smile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I don't think they'll be from here. Well, no, I, mean, I think you, you're, you've got a great perspective. But I do want to start with a question that, that your a presentation raised in my mind, which I think would be useful in particular. And that is, on the one hand, you're producing the information that is required for any independent prosecutor or judicial system to use, use happily to prosecute judicial. Um, on the other hand, that is not. And so you've stepped in yourself as a Supreme Audit Institution, kind of try to play the role of bringing the legal case, of bringing the legal action. So my question is, what is your standing, if any, to do that? Do you have within your writ or within your, you know, within the legislation that creates you, do you have, I think it would be interesting for the audience to know, do you have certain legal standing? Can you bring a case yourself uh, as, the, as the plaintiff? Um, first of all, I would like to say that when I started to work for a company like that, uh, I found that the law was legal law. Uh, and and uh, we did the first year we did the research on all the legal acts for, for both uh, the for the world. Okay. And uh, we managed to pass to the parliament after a lot of time. Of, of the thing in the act. And pretty much we have every um, power that we engage to the fight against that. But we don't have the power to send the case directly to the court. We send them to the prosecution authority. And uh, after they close them, we have the right to complain to them. We manage to, to, to present. Uh, our problems with the uh, 
legal changes that happened in the justice report, and now the prosecutors cannot close the cases without uh, uh, doing this. Um, what we have done from the beginning, we decided not to just give information to the prosecutors because it might be easier for them to close the case, but to be kind of the prosecutors ourselves present uh, the cases in the most, uh, in the better way we could do, with all the evidence we could. We, we photocopy everything when we go to the audit institution. We, we have a copy of all the, 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 the files we sent to the prosecutor authority. And uh, we also have tried to work a little bit with the media. The time we send the case to the prosecutor authority is to present something to the media, so the public would know, the media would know, and then uh, we, we want to, to, to start a positive pressure on the prosecutor authority. And then we again publish everything when the case is closed. And we invite uh, journalists to be part of the, of the uh, court sessions to present ourselves. And so you, you indicated that you actually did a kind of comparative review, if you will, of different legislative yeah. initiatives to create audit institutions around the world. So you're a bit of an expert on how it's supposed to work in different countries. Did you see other examples, sort of drilling down further on this work? Did you see examples of other Supreme Audit institutions that, in effect, can act legally? Agents, what I have seen, I mean, there's more of a problem of the real. More than a legal problem. Right. Indeed. Uh, so but most of the SAIs want to, to be engaged in prevention. So I want to turn to Anita because you, you discussed uh, a couple of interesting points for substantive, substantive purposes about what accountability office does to help other, other institutions in the world to work with them um, and to join international collaborative efforts to gain work. Um, let's start with how your fellowship program, what they would be interested in. So let's learn a little bit more about how that works. Um, sure. The, the International Fellows Program um, is a, a long-standing program. Um, and I participated last year. Was. Um, we have representatives from um, upwards of 30 countries come for um, a session, and it's an, an intensive, um, uh, an intensive extended seminar um, covering um, specific audit issues, um, issues um, facing audit institutions. It's really about auditing in general, not necessarily specific to, um, you know, anti-corruption, right. anti-corruption efforts. But it is an excellent opportunity. Um, for an attending fellow to take on, um, for example, a specific topic, so this, um, this could be right for. So, a, a, a graduate of this fellow program comes out with the skill to audit process. Absolutely. Processes, whether it's fraud, performance, corruption, or any other, all the above. Correct. Yeah. Um, but in my remarks, I, I included some information about Intosai, which I think is right. really more. Um, which you're inquiring about, and that is that umbrella, the UN umbrella organization for the size of the world, um, to uh, where we come together to develop um, one to coordinate and, and two to develop um, guidances um, to uh, enhance our auditing ability um, standards, improving auditing standards, and so we've divided ourselves into these working groups along these issue lines. Um, I was very active in the working group on the fight against corruption and money laundering and the subgroup um, on asset recovery. Um, but what I'm finding is, as I become involved in other working groups, there are synergies, I think, that have not yet been realized. So, for example, that working group on the audit of extractives, um, there's a working group on procurement, um, 
There are um, there is another working group looking at tax issues and revenue issues. So I think there are, are ways and opportunities for us on the horizon to kind of be a common thread among all those and perhaps explore ways where we can address all of these activities that corruption facilitates. Because it's because of the poor set of skills. That's correct. Process. Uh, for, uh, but sticking with GAO itself for a minute, what you do as a state, uh, it sounds, and, and, and maybe you can clarify or eliminate, but it sounds like you're more likely to end up examining fraud as a as an issue than corruption. That's correct. Just the way that we approach our work, we tend to, um, well, that programmatic um, approach, and we'll look across agencies, perhaps, at a, at a, um, when examining an issue. I think um, corruption might be an issue that the IG community, the Inspector General community here in the United States, would take on more directly, um, and that's you know, at the federal level, and then below that at the state and local level. And, you know, Tell us a little bit about what um, you do to determine whether to take them. What, how does that happen? Well, there are two ways GAO um, can, can initiate work. Um, most of our work is undertaken at the request of Congress. Um, so um, uh, congressional representatives and senators, senators um, in leadership positions on committees will send us request letters um, outlining their concerns. Um, and areas that they would like GAO to explore. Um, those are the um, requests that we prioritize. Um, we certainly would love to, but we certainly can't entertain requests from, from everybody. But can you take a request from civil society? No, no, no. It, it, it must be from Congress. Um, the second way um, that it can come from Congress is it can, uh, Congress can mandate us. So many times you'll find um, provisions and legislation that require GAO to undertake work. Um, and then separate and apart from Congress, um, the Controller General of the United States, which is the head of GAO, can initiate work under his authority. How about you, Amal? What, how do you choose many possibilities for the federal? We are local leaders in the sense of And uh, we are kind of Let's do a cross comparison. How we get access to 
we have had a huge problem on access to parole. And we thought with a total access to parole. Previously, our institution thought that any and the uh, constitution is not all the protected information for more than five years. And this was uh, from a court decision. And we reopened the case and we won the case, and after that, we changed the law. Now we have sort of secure, secret information. And we can see it. I want to know that most government agencies live in fear of getting requests. <laughs> That might be a little strong. I don't know. <laughs> but they're in fear. Well, that in so far might as. Might be a mild threat. Yeah, mild threat. Uh, um, yeah, certainly we have, but through our audit authority, access to, right. to data from, from the agencies. I think uh, an important um, note to point out is that we've established protocols with many agencies about how we obtain data, how we request the data, how we uh, maintain that data. Um, so I. Uh, that's because been, there are other equities here. Privacy, security. Certainly, and then those uh, I think protocols have really gone a long way um, to dealing with access issues. Even though we do experience them, I think those protocols have been very safe. Finally, we found that uh, it's a very big problem that the things change. And they don't uh, use the same uh, method or form on reporting to the parliament. And it's very difficult to compare the performance of over the years. And we are planning to propose uh, on big data. Uh, also to frame the way that they report to them. This way is a little more useful for us. We present them with the real templates of tables and data that we want to get from them. So it's a very important. So uh, I'm going to come out to the audience in just a minute, but I want to propose one more question, which is goes back to Paul's initial statement in his opening that you have a few allies. You do, I think, come to get a lot of different types of support in there. No support. Or no house support. Financial. That's, well, <laughs> maybe there was a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just maybe. Um, so I think an issue, it would be interesting for both of you to comment both on the specifics of the Albania case. What, what can be done? I mean, if I hear you talk, I hear you describing your desire to champion and build it. But you're also building the, set, the, the, the legislative and legal framework that's required to make your institution work better. You draft your law. You're, you're reforming a system as well. As, but that's, that's massively difficult. Um, you, know, you work in a system which is very mature, has uh, certain efficiencies, it's perfect. We have huge issues in this country, which GAO may or may not be very important, but um, I've got there I go with the um, So, uh, I guess the question for you for both take a shot at is what can we be doing internationally okay, to build up this phenomenon, side phenomenon, what can we do to create more of them, make it work better, um, uh, how, does, how do we come out of this process that Open Health Club is sponsoring here with more robust mm -hmm. Community of being uh, audience. Well, uh, I uh, very experienced I think that uh, the future, our role be that of evaluating the education state strategy against corruption. Every state has its own strategy against corruption. And it should be the government, it's 
president, which is very old, but not the government. He was the risk of corruption. And every time we did that, the government, you can imagine the results. But in our point of view, this, this strategy should be for the problem, and then the problem is someone external dependent, given it. And also, international institutions need an external independence, like FAI, for the of corruption. And for the moment, transparency internationally is the only one that um, evaluates the perception of corruption. But maybe SAIs can be talk uh, uh, from Oda on uh, evaluating. So difficult every time. So in the future, I see SAIs sharing this kind of experience in evaluating strategy and evaluating the hidden problem. So, thank you. Do you want to comment? Yeah. Well, I, I think I would. in developing um, audit guidance. It's a strange world. We live in the auditing world, and uh, it's quite helpful um, to hear what the other sides who have different authorities. Um, for example, we have a, my team, which is the forensic audits and investigate. We have an investigative component. But not all sides have that. Other sides have um, you know, authorities that go beyond that. Prosecutorial authorities, which, which you inquired about earlier. So it really is that that thing that really makes a difference in terms of capacity Thank you very much. So, the um, floor is now open. Please let us know who you are and give us a, a question. Frank, go ahead, please. Hey, hi, thank you. I uh, love your presentation. My name is Frank Hogan with uh, Transparency International. Tell us a bit about protecting whistleblowers in both Albania and in Afghanistan. It seems to me that you were mentioning that many of the cases you get come from whistleblowers. And I'd be fascinated to know how both of these countries, which according to some reports even by TI, are perceived to be quite corrupt. Um, how do you how do you really protect the whistleblowers? How do you give them the confidence that they won't be murdered or something less uh, for reporting to you, especially about very senior government? Well, it's very difficult to deal with the situation of uh, corruption cases presented by whistleblowers. We have built um, over the years. People see what we do and they trust our We don't request names when they write them. We don't want them to know them. We don't know who they are. We just receive the letters, evaluate how we call to be, and we just send the book to verify them. Sometimes we just gather the information. Because we receive no letters for the same for the same topic, and we wait. But we don't request them. That's all. We just accept every information that is created. On behalf of the of Afghanistan, let me address that question in two ways. First, to say that um, the country has undertaken its. Uh, Obligations under the United Nations Convention Against Corruption to write new laws protecting whistleblowers very seriously. And that is a process that, that's going forward. So they are creating the legislative framework that would, in theory, uh, at some point, provide protection. 
Um, it's a, I don't think there's a good answer to that question in, in the case of Afghanistan. I think the, I actually think it's difficult to find a good answer to that question in lots of parts of the world. Uh, glad you raised it. Um, now, Afghanistan has particularly multi layered challenge insofar as the security issues themselves pose risks for anybody who's active in any aspect of civil society. We were, while I was there uh, in January and February, uh, we had planned a wonderful conference about women and anti corruption that we actually had to pull down at the last minute because we couldn't get agreement from the women leaders in government, different positions of civil service from the event. So, um, and, and I will say this, that as part of our methodology, when we do these vulnerability to corruption assessments, we are relying heavily on the goodwill of people to supply us with the subjective information uh, the quality, you know, the qualitative part of our assessments to go out and do focus groups, and sometimes we are spurred by a whistleblower that will come in and identify a given government process that needs to be studied. So uh, there's a lot of very brave and courageous people who are willing to nobly step forward and say, "This has been my experience with paying taxes or with getting a good teacher for my child," and so there's that is happening. But it was hardly at a point where, where anybody can see that session. Please. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mark. My name is Tom Wiggins, and my website is called Meet BDC. And this question is directed towards um, Ms. Illich. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the next level once corruption is uncovered. And who do you interact with in terms of uh, prosecutorial factors? Is it another branch of the government, such as the FBI? Uh, who would be the legislative um, enforcement on that? And then carrying that over into international relations, because that obviously becomes much more complicated than you know, other governments, especially if it's a non-NATO government. You know, how does that work, and does that work, or is it split along cultural lines, et cetera? Probably. And then the last question is, how is it you look so well rested for a person who takes on responsibilities that you do? <laughs> um, thank you kindly. If you only knew, I was up till 11.30 with an eight-year-old who was sick with people, so thank you so much. Um, to, to your first question, um, through the course of our work, if there is any indication of a violation of criminal statute, we have a process to make uh, a referral to um, the appropriate federal investigative authority. So that is not something that, that we would, would take on. Uh, we would then, in your example, pass that on to FBI. Um, in terms of, I think you asked internationally, um, so your question would be, so if we found indications of um, corruption of a foreign official, um, in our examination of a U.S. program, is that what is that what you're well, is, that, is that the heart of your question? Or obviously, uh, prosecutorial uh, campaigns are broken along fissures of governments. And sure. If there's a military aspect, say for instance, if you go going up against Russia, okay, that's a whole different ball wax than going up against someone in Britain. Um. Well, I put. GAO's audit authority, they, I think it would still be the same. We would still make a referral to an investigative agency. We just do not have that authority ourselves um, to take that on. But we do have processes involved. That's something that we do regularly. So hopefully that gets close to an answer. Please go ahead. Um, I'm Manuel Bambino, and I work for Transparency in Brazil. In Brazil. Um, I have um, two questions. One, what is the role of civil society um, 
organizations uh, with the audit institutions that you work for. You already comment a little bit, but I would like to understand more your view of how they can contribute today in the way, in the mandate that you have today and maybe the future. Um, and the second question, uh, which is important for Brazil, I would like to, to understand in the context of each country, um, how, uh, as my understanding, the federal institutions like JO and the Albania and Afghanistan, they deal with the fact that, uh, I don't know how it is in Albania, but uh, the US is a federal country, so the states and the municipalities, they have uh, its own uh, uh, competence, uh, so it may not be easy uh, uh, to deal with the fact that the corruption or the fraud may happen at not at the federal level. So how the federalism issue uh, impact the work of your institutions? Thank you. Well, why don't we start? Uh, regarding the role of civil society, um, I think it's a very important role. Um, the civil society can, can, can help us in the following up process of our organization. Uh, we publish everything on our website. They can see our audit report. They can see the recommendation we sent to the audit group. <clears throat> and we have a problem following up. It's a huge process. It takes time, it takes years. The recommendation can be, can be replied after two years, after three years, after we don't know. But civil society can, can focus on a specific institution and see what this institution has done with the implementation of our recommendation. Also, the civil society can be our voice in times of pressure. For example, we might not be able or we don't want to be directly engaged in public or topic for the moment because the parliament or politics might interpret our work. But this can be done by civil society. We just take our reports and they start being our voice for the moment. Also, they can be engaged in training, so they can help us in training. Certain uh, topics, uh, we can send our auditors to the training they do. They can also collaborate in, uh, in between institutions. Civil society can be linked between different institutions. That's how I see their role. Regarding the problem of uh, federal, federal uh, States, um, we kind of have the same problem with internal audits or, or audits um, uh, that are paid by us. And the problem is where you find something different or your reports do not go through to the reports of the internal audit. And you have two reports, one positive, one negative. Who's the right one? But it doesn't matter, it happens. It will happen all the time. All it matters is publish everything and let the public judge with the right one. Great. Back in the back of the room. Thank you. Thanks. So, hi, my name is Kamal as well. I'm uh, Albanian. I work at the World Bank. I'm involved in a project in the Balkans on parliamentary strengthening. So, we do look at a lot at the Parliament and SAI relationship, and I have many questions, but I will try to find two of them in one, and they have to do with the Parliament side relationship, first of all, and secondly, on the like independence of the of the SAIs as well. You know, recently there was uh, uh, the Open Budget Index uh, looked at you know, the recent data, basically show an interesting trend that a lot of these offices, especially in the region, uh, they're strengthened institutions per se in terms of being very professional, but what seems to be lacking is the follow-up on the recommendations, right? The recommendations and opinions being produced by these offices not being followed up. And I was wondering, I wanted to take the insights from uh, Armand regarding uh, like what, in your opinion, should
should be done to kind of strengthen the importance and the follow up of these recommendations. So you have, there are cases in countries where there is, you know, the, the SAI track these implementations so there is more um, kind of pressure to strengthen that uh, relationship with the parliament, right? In order to kind of have more debate and kind of create, generate that policy pressure. And then on the independence, you know, I know it's a very tricky issue, but, uh, but uh, you know, a lot of countries, you know, like who points ahead of the SAI and issues like that, and uh, the budget of the, of the, because, you know, with the budget, you can be tricked uh, as well. So yeah. you can just share some of those insights. Uh, okay. I will answer both questions. Very interesting question. So regarding the implementation of the recommendation, it's always a matter of pressure. Let's do more pressure to do more. And you should use every method you can. For the moment, we, we, we are proposing a draft change in the uh, rules for the parliament. The parliament don't have the procedural rules for to deal with other communication. And we want to present to, to, to the parliament some legal changes. So they have concrete procedures. What to do when we send them our report, we will use the report. And maybe we, we are proposing the idea of having a special parliamentary commission in dealing with uh, the recommendation. Uh, also, we want to, to put the implementation of the recommendation as a template on every yearly report that the institution sends to the department. For example, ministry. If they set this template in a certain page where they have to report yearly to the department what they have done with our recommendation, the follow-up process is much more easier. And it's much more easier to do pressure on them because the media, the, the public, the civil society just look at the table and see what's going on with the recommendation. Also, we, for the moment, are developing an IT system, internal one, and we had this idea to put the code with the recommendation. And by reading the code, it's easier to see if it's a civil recommendation, if it's an administrative one, if it's a criminal charge, if it's, uh, I don't know, whatever, it's a legal recommendation, just being at the code. And then you group the codes for every institution, and then you compare the codes over the, over the years. It's, uh, we are facilitating the process of uh, recommendation. Regarding the second question about independence, there are many forms how to, to, to intimidate us. You can lower our budget, you can uh, um, use another kind of the SAI, uh, you can, um, you know, you, you can uh, double our, 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 duplicate our, our, our function. Mm -hmm. For example, you create a second one that, you, and you are always competing with that uh, second structure with different reports. Um, I think the, what we have, what I have seen, during these five years working for an antenna. It's not a matter of, uh, you can be independent if you want. Nobody impedes you. Uh, you can use the budget that you have, and you can use those resources that you have, but you can still be independent. It's a matter of choosing what you want to do. Uh, to me, maybe this would be a good place for you to weigh in on how the relationship between Congress and GAO works has worked historically to preserve your independence. Uh, and whether, I mean, do we think this is a model for other countries? Um, are there limitations on it? I mean, I, I suppose it can be a model for, for other countries, but it, it's important to remember that we, the American tradition is a unique one, so we certainly, um, our, our path to where we are is. I think singular. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know that it's one that we would necess necessarily 
yeah, recommend but this is, uh, the model. But it's a very good question though, because uh, I like the way well, I like the way you answered because basically what you said is regardless of what the law thinks, regardless of what your budget may be an issue, there are ways that you can be manipulated. I'm assuming that the GAO has a certain, because of its long-standing existence, because of champions in the contest, um, nobody's about to just pull your budget and then give it. But we're always concerned about our budget. We always. Well, you're concerned about how big it is. <laughs> but but I, I think yeah. we can go down to um, kind of a very low level. Um, in terms of how we go about our work, which I think has um, an outsized effect on our independence. Right. And that is, as I said earlier, you know, Congress can certainly request us to conduct work, but they cannot di dictate how we do that work right. or the results of that work. Mm -hmm. And um, it, to, to complement our most responses regarding recommendation follow-up, what GAO does is right. um, for each report that we, we, we publish on our website, and click on a tab and it lists the recommendations that we made mm -hmm. in the report, the status of those recommendations. And so uh, one process is um, upon um, issuance of the report, the affected agency must submit to us um, a letter in broad strokes outlining how they intend right. to approach implementing that recommendation. And then um, on a regular interval thereafter, um, many times on an annual basis, GAO follows up as part of um, other processes um, with the agency uh, to learn about the status um, of that recommendation. And many times agencies uh, want to get that recommendation closed as soon as possible and will certainly uh, reach out to us to um, describe their efforts and provide documentation for us. But a, a given citizen can go on that website and find out. Exactly. Exactly. So again, we are of service not only to congressional committees, but it, this really is for the taxpayer. This is this is for all of you to know how and when your money is being spent. Just insert very quickly from the Afghanistan perspective here. Um, the um, this is an issue um, on which, uh, as I mentioned, the the MEC is under a lot of scrutiny these days because uh, it's maturing. Um, it's becoming more visible and effective in its reporting. And those who are invested in anti-corruption in Afghanistan have started to call us on whether we're doing a good job of following up our own recommendations and making sure that they're implemented. And so there's a lot of need for improvement within uh, the MEC mission and, and our strategy for, um, for getting out um, and making sure that we are both measuring and holding people accountable for implementing very specific, as I indicated before, smart recommendations. Um, and then on the independence question, um, I think an exciting possibility for the MEC going forward in terms of whether it can become a GAO or a Supreme Audit Institution is whether it could be funded by the government of Afghanistan. If so, whether this could be done you know, through the parliament, and uh, or whether it would be done through some federal, some presidential discretionary fund, and if so, what implications that would have for its for our independence? We're very much weighing and evaluating those issues at this stage, and it would be crucial. Um, I should say that the the local champions of the MEC are very skeptical of whether they can have independence. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I'll take. Why don't we take? There's three hands up. We'll take all three questions, then we'll wrap. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you. My name is Kathleen Brophy. I work with Oxfam. Um, I started my anti-corruption advocate career uh, in East Africa, studying and working and advocating against corruption. Um, and so my question is, based on my experience um, working in Uganda on corruption, working very closely with the SIA there, um, Ermal, a lot of what you said really resonated with me. People. Um, um, not being able to continue the pursuit of corruption due to no electricity or um, no ink that they that they hit somewhere. Yeah, um, and so I really sympathize with you there. My question is more in cases where corruption is not actually an aberration of the operating system, but is actually uh, a common characteristic of the operating system, and therefore the SEI is actually a bit of an outlier when it comes to the rest of government architecture and government norms. 
Um, I ask this because in those cases, in many countries like the ones I've worked in, the SAI can actually become a tool for the perpetuation of high-level corruption. So I'll give you an example, one that you brought up, which is um, two, there's two different instances. One, where you could publish a 700-page report every year, which is in your mandate, um, and knowing that um, at, at the end of every paragraph it says, we recommend the prosecutor general to follow up on these recommendations. Knowing that the prosecutor general is under the system that is not in your kind of in your vein, it's, it's part of the, the corrupt architecture. Knowing that those recommendations will go nowhere. The other instance, which you brought up, which is the perpetual kind of pursuit of these low-level technocrats that are actually scapegoats for the kingpins, right? So in many countries where I mean, you just get these people rolling in and out of these different departments because they keep going for the most high level in every department that are actually the the ones, you know, causing a really systemic cultural corruption. So how do you get past those types of limitations where your you know, your results are perpetually irrelevant because they, they're meant not to be used and where you are kind of this shop for the for the flow of these low-level technocrats who keep getting these these charges that are actually meant for for the ones who are perpetuating corruption just in my case those are two instances where the sai has actually been used by the powers of be to make the rest of the world think yes we are pursuing corruption but in reality they're actually just pursuing um this 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 shallow attempt um, um at, at corruption prevention thank you great question hi i'm andrew Middleman from development gateway um, I'm wondering if in either of your instances you use analytics tools to help you sort of um, determine whether there might be corruption um, within a system or um, collusion or fraud. For example, in the U.S. we have USASpending.gov. You could take that data um, and run a bunch of analytics on it to figure out if there's, you know, characteristics that would be, um, you know, characteristics of, of, of potential fraud or collusion. And I'm wondering if either of you use any tools um, of that nature. And there was a third question there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melissa Pesnieta. Um, So a lot of the times when it comes to those conversations about Supreme Audit institutions, it's always like the means and the tools needed in this country to curtail corruption. However, we always forget that corruption is part of the culture. So I can speak, you know, I guess uh, for Albania due to experience is that, you know, over the years of being under Ottoman Empire and under the, the communist leader of Enver Hoxha, we're, people were subdued to these strict laws and mentally you have to go under the law. So that creates that corruption into the culture. So yet we're providing these reforms that are not really providing the necessary results because you can take one person down, yet another person comes up because under this culture that are born under, it's corruption continues. So how do Supreme Audit institutions kind of help the culture in some sort of way or if any, you know, if there's, I guess, any sort of role that it can take into it where it really will create the optimal result. Thanks. Okay, so um, these are all, it's, all three of them are extremely good questions. Um, and we're gonna have to reduce them. We're gonna have to answer them pretty quickly, um, but I think your points are well made, so. I'm glad you made the intervention. Um, why, if you can, Armal, answer the, there's basically two questions I'm going to boil them to. One is, how do you work, um, if the operating system is corrupt, how do you, you create a competing operating system? Uh, especially when the cultural challenges are very steep, and what are the, what are the best analytical tools that you use? And why don't we each take a cut at that, and then we're going to have to uh, wrap, it, wrap it up. Okay, uh, regarding the system, uh, yes, it's true. The system can facilitate corruption, can fight corruption, can promote corruption. And uh, the answer is to deal with the system. The system. Regarding procurement, we, we have found that uh, the top level management doesn't have any legal duty to sign in. That's why we never charge the uh, criminal charges on, on, on cases about uh, public procurement. We want to change it and we want to force the top leaders manage to sign at the end of the process. So then when we find problems, 
we can take criminal charges towards them. So it's a it's a scenario when we want to change the system. And uh, regarding the tools, uh, we in Albania for many years now have key procurement. We can see everything that facilitates us a lot. We can go back and see what happened two years before, three years before. We don't have to be present at the OTT. We just have a username and password open and see every document there. And uh, we also do risk analysis. That helps us a lot. And regarding the third question, I will answer also that. Uh, it's not only a matter of culture of corruption. There's also culture of non function and if you compare, if you have both of these cultures, then it's a total map. So you you have to uh, to to work also on the culture of fun, even though you have a culture of uh, and that way they those cultures. The second one is an anti culture, so that way they compete. You know, I think, again, those are great questions to end on. And they, they point up the very importance of the Supreme institution, which is, is, after all, a product of these oh, they didn't grow out of, didn't come off the shelf from a problem. It's grown in Albania, it's grown in There's something happening in Afghanistan. So um, something in the value system, in the water system, if you will, that produces these these auto institutions. The question is, what role can they play in addressing the culture with what tools? Um, I think those are good subjects to take up in your next session, the B session. And so I'm going to start the bidding on the B countries. I think Bulgaria, uh, Brazil, um, Bangladesh would be a good place to go next time around. Um, and I'm also I'm glad to see you all smiling. <laughs> but thanks everybody and thanks for this yeah, again, thank you very much Yeah, I met with the World Bank. So